theme is authority. And authority can be a very problematic concept. And it has to be in some way further defined for it to really grasp deep into the whole relationship between God and ourselves. Authority, as we know, and Jesus mentions it in the scripture, has many ways of being exercised. The 10th chapter of Mark, he talks about the business of lording it over people. And he says, well, you have to serve people instead of lording it over them. And what does that mean to have authority as a service within the community? What is that all about? So what I'd like to do is I would like to start with a very fundamental concept about the whole nature of the human person and the whole nature of the community of believers. And I want to start with the Trinity. Now we acknowledge the Trinity all the time, every time we make the sign of the cross, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those who do pray the Liturgy of the Hours, at the end of every psalm, there is a glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. But somehow or other, through the ages, that has, in many ways, that idea of the Trinity has become an abstraction for us. And I recall many years ago, and Bishop Campbell mentioned it to me just last night, actually, many years ago was a young priest. One of the things that we always dreaded was preaching on the Feast of the Holy Trinity. And the most that we could come up with on something like that is, well, it's a mystery. And we thought if we could convey the fact it was a mystery, which everyone already knew, then we somehow or other had done very well. Well, I was the pastor of a parish up in the North End, and after I had done all that, some woman came up to me and said, you know, I'm so sick of hearing that. <laughs> and uh, I said, hmm. I said, well, what should I have said? She said something interesting. She said, any married couple with a child knows more about the Trinity than that. And I thought about that, and I said to myself, you know, she was correct. And it's time for me to go back and rethink all of this all over again. Because this is more significant for us than we tend to treat it. First of all, in the book of Genesis, it says to us that we are created in the image and in the likeness of God. The question then comes, what does it mean in scriptural terminology to be an image of something? And you know that in Scripture, an image is always forbidden. It's always a bad thing. It's always idolatry. Because the image and the reality are always the same. And so when God says we're in his image and likeness, it means that we participate in his being. That's what makes us human. If we participate in his being, who is God? God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is a unity that is held together by an infinite transcendent bond of love. And the love is so powerful and so strong that it draws the three persons into one being. And as such, it means this. You and I, in our humanity, are essentially relational beings. We are relational because the fulfillment of our whole nature is to be in relationships of love. You experience in your families, in your communities, and so forth. With that as the model, and with that as the fundamental truth of the human person, how is the human person then to be drawn into a unity, a oneness, a community? And here, then, we find we have to explore what it means to be united in love and how that comes about. There's an ancient philosophical problem that has, that has racked the world for centuries. And the question is this. Are you, as a person, separate and individual, or are we, as humanity, 
the greatest reality. Which is it? Is it the universal humanity or is it the individual person? You take that struggle and you make it into a philosophical argument which has been for centuries and what we find is that when you answer a question like that, you come up with two very different concepts of what the world should look like. You come up with, if I am the most important thing as an individual person, then my rights and what I want takes priority. And we enter into a society and a world of what we call radical individualism, where we are all in a sense alienated from the larger pictures. And we struggle then to affirm our right over and against everyone else. If we say humanity is the greater reality, we run the risk of suppressing the individual. And what happens is we could end up with the Soviet society. We could end up with tyranny. We can end up with oppression. We can end up with all of those things. So if that's the problem, if that's the situation, then how do we find the way to deal with you as a person and with us as a community? How does that happen? If we use the Trinitarian concept, it means that somehow or other, love has to come into play to draw together the individuals into the community without destroying either one. And that is not as easy as it might sound. One of the things I think that we have to look at, and that is a very important thing, what happens when we can't find that balance? What happens when there is no force within the world that reconciles the one and the many, that brings them together into a creative and loving relationship. I remember a couple very dramatic instances in the not too far distant past. And one of those was in Ireland, maybe 10 years ago. There was a young girl who was pregnant and wanted an abortion. It was against the law in Ireland, so she was going to go to England to get it. But Irish law forbade women to leave the country to participate in an illegal act. And so it was a furor. And I don't know how many of you remember Father McBrien from Notre Dame, who used to have a column in the papers and so forth. He, of course, was outraged. This was an affront against democracy. This was tyranny. This was on and on and on and on and on. And he wrote a long and vitriolic column about it because the position he was taking was this. The one is an absolute, and the many have no right to restrict the one's freedom. It's tyranny. It's not democracy, he said. He had no understanding whatsoever that the community itself has a right not to be oppressed by the need or the desire or the want of an individual. Where is the reconciliation? Where does that transpire? Where does all that take place? And the answer to it is in a very loaded term. The answer is in authority. Authority is in the accommodation of Trinitarian love to the realities of the human condition. And that authority, therefore, is a form of love. Because what it hopes to do is to hold together the human community and creation itself, we shall see, as that which makes life possible and sustainable for the many. And that which draws it also 
into a deeper fulfillment of who it is. Where is this internal, essential relationality? If I can do whatever I want and society has to bend to my desire or my need. Am I in a real relationship with the community? Or am I in a power struggle to get my way over and against what is perceived to be the common good? The relationship ceases to be one of love and becomes one of power when the individual has the right to oppress or coerce the community into accommodating its every need. We see that, how many see that in modern American society? There it is. The whole business, abortion, the whole business, gay marriage, the whole business, all of that stuff, all of it is this kind of a struggle. And how do we find a solution, a resolution to that? The answer that comes to us from the Word of God and the answer that comes to us from the church is that there is something legitimately called authority in the midst of the world whose task it is to reach out to all the diverse realities of the world and to draw them closer in to some kind of harmonious relationship that makes human life possible. If, in fact, we break down into this radically individualized society, nobody is safe. Anybody can do whatever they want. And in doing that, we rip apart the fabric of society. And we rip apart that fabric of society. We destroy the well-being of the whole. If, in fact, the individual means nothing, then we have the Soviet Union. Then we have Chairman Mao's China. Then we have the tyrannies that exist all over the world and in every way and in every place. And so if that's the case, then the society, it's not a good thing. On the other hand, individuality is not a good thing either if it rips everything apart. What is the answer? There must be a source, a power that flows out of the Trinitarian love into the midst of the world to reconnect the broken pieces of sinful humanity which has damaged not only society but creation itself. And it has to draw those into some form of reconciled coexistence that is based on the proposition that the fulfillment of the human person is realized most particularly when it is in a healthy relationship with one another and with the rest of society. That involves sometimes discipline. Any of you who have had children know that there is such a thing as discipline which becomes necessary as a form of your parental authority. And it's like just yesterday or today, I'm not sure which it was, in Rhode Island, Congressman Patrick Kennedy um, blasted the Catholic bishops for their opposition to an abortion-neutral health care bill and said he just doesn't understand what such a useless thing is all about. And the Bishop of Providence said he felt very strongly also that Congressman Kennedy owed the Catholic Church an apology because of his ignorant and irresponsible position. <laughs> Being charitable does not mean rolling over and playing dead. Bishop Tobin took on the modern Pharisees in the same tone that Christ took on the Pharisees of the first century. And that, we cannot say, was done without charity on the part of Jesus. And so authority has many faces to it. 
It might not always be the gentle love of Father, Son, and Spirit, but we are human and we have sinned, and so it isn't exactly the way it should be. And so Jesus made the accommodation to our sinfulness, and he entrusted this incredibly deep gift of love to an authority that is at the center and as the foundation of the community who believe in him. It is not a personal gift when it is given to the church either. Pope Leo the Great made this very clear. He called himself an unworthy heir. It inheres in the office, not in the person. So we can have a very unworthy person, but the office is part of the communal structure that Jesus has given us. And as such, remember in the scriptures where Jesus says about the Pharisees, they sit on the seat of Moses, do what they say, but don't do what they do. He made it very clear there is a distinction between person and office when it comes to legitimate authority in the midst of the church. And so to invest some kind of popular celebrity and say, well, I'm going to listen to this man because this man I like, but I don't like this man, so I'm not going to listen to him. Or I don't like what this woman is saying, so I'm not going to listen to her. If they have the authority to say it, we listen. Because it is an exercise in Trinitarian love within the community. We may always assert ourselves against this authority. If I, in my conscience, and Marcus talked about this, if I, in my conscience, disagree with authority, I have a right to say so. But I do not have a right to either separate myself ultimately from the community or to fracture that community. And that takes, we call it obedience, but really what it is, is humility. It is the very core, I have done what I felt was the right thing to do, but I have not pitted myself against the presence of the Holy Spirit and the body of Christ in the midst of the world. And that is where the creative and the dynamic struggle of Catholicism is. We can kick against the goad, but we can't go outside the parameters of the body of the Lord. And so authority is there. It's elastic because of that. It allows that kind of freedom. I've always said, you know, in Catholicism, we have nothing to fear about what we think or feel because eventually we will come up against the benevolent parameters of God's revelation. And we will have then the grace to move back into unity and to contribute what we have, our insights, our thoughts, and at the same time understand that I am not God and that somehow or other I have no right to break the community to pieces. And I think another example of what this is all about do you remember, um, not so long ago, and especially New Englanders will remember this, Bishop, the Episcopalian Bishop Gene Robinson in New Hampshire? That's a classic case. I'm going to do what I want to do. And if it breaks the whole community apart, so be it. It's their fault. It's not mine. We can't do that. And certainly, if we look at this kind of experience and example in the church, we find, for instance, that does, do any of you think Martin Luther might have had some legitimate complaints? Might have had some good ideas? Sure he did. And the contribution he could have made to the cohesiveness and the growth and the dynamic life of the community but falling into this idea that the individual takes priority over the well-being of others 
is something that is foreign to that very internal and essential understanding that benevolent relationship is what makes us human and that we denigrate and cheapen our humanity when we choose in any way, shape, or form to destroy the bond that holds. Many of you struggle with this kind of thing in your family life. How far out can a child go before you have to decide, does the relationship snap or is there enough elasticity eventually, maybe, to recall and to pull back? How much room do you give? How much time do you... You never say, oh, well, they must be right, especially if they're not. But you can say, I have to expand my capacity to love beyond the parameters of what I feel is acceptable in order that eventually there might be a strong enough bond to reconcile this person into this community. Authority, therefore, is not necessarily a hammer. It is a bond of love, but it can be a hard bond of love at times, and it should be a hard bond of love at times. We know that authority disciplines us. We have seen and we know, if the scripture says, the father doesn't love the son if the father doesn't discipline the son at times when it's necessary. We have seen in just the last couple of days the Bishop of Providence taking this rather seriously and saying, I have an obligation to recall the Pharisees to some kind of truth and to some kind of way of life that strengthens and that holds bound this bond that was given to us, not necessarily from outside, this bond that is given to us from creation itself. One of the problems in the Middle Ages, in this whole issue between the particular and the universal, the singular, and the whole. One of the reasons they could never resolve it and that it went awry was the fact that we made the whole too small. And we said it is only humanity that we're dealing with. But you know, in the story of creation, God made everything. Everything, therefore, falls under the authority of God. And that authority, which is a manifestation in a broken world as of love, means that the church's authority, which comes from Jesus Christ, the church's authority is extensible to the whole of creation. Have you noticed some of the things that the Holy Father is beginning to address. He's beginning to address environmental issues, not crazily and not fanatically, but says somehow our relationship with the earth must also be benevolent, must be one of love. He begins to address the whole structures of human societies besides our own, not through ordering a restructuring of France or Germany or the United States, teaching authority, the authority of per persuasion, the authority of conviction, the authority of conversation, the center that holds the whole thing together. It is not just humanity. When humanity falls apart, when humanity falls apart, notice the world around us falls apart as well. When we are consumed by hatred, we blow things up. When we are consumed by greed, we exploit everything around us. 
when we are consumed by lust, we destroy the whole reproductive cycle. When we are consumed by all of these things, the earth suffers. Remember the tremendous criticism that Benedict XVI encountered when he had that mention about condoms in Africa? You know, anyone with any common sense, any honest person knows that's not a foolproof way to prevent either pregnancy or the spread of disease. He spoke the truth and he caused a firestorm. And the Parliament of Belgium, I think, condemned him for it. But ultimately, <laughs> didn't frighten him, I don't think. But ultimately, people came forward once, once it was safe to come out of the storm. And so many in the medical profession in Africa said he's right. Many secularists dealing with African issues said, well, you know, he's right. It's the restructuring of the whole idea of family that is going to ultimately halt the AIDS epidemic in Africa that the problem is exacerbated by a false sense of security and that leads to a type of behavior that is deadly. He spoke with authority and he taught the world something for its own good, its own well-being, its own survival. And when he did that, the world, of course, reacted vehemently against him. And when the dust settled, yeah, he was right. And he made it possible to discuss solutions that were not political ideology, but that dealt with the real life of men and women in a very difficult and suffering part of the world. He taught, and he taught with authority. And that becomes, for us, a very important lesson. It becomes a lesson in our families. It becomes a lesson in our local church communities. It becomes a lesson in the whole church. And it becomes a lesson for humanity. And humanity is beginning to listen from time to time, interestingly enough. And here's another modern situation. There is a German philosopher by the name of Jürgen Habermas. He became kind of the philosopher of the whole justification for secular societies in Europe. And before Benedict was elected pope, there was a symposium that was held at Habermas's request in Munich, where he and Cardinal Ratzinger we're going to discuss the problems that had arisen from the institution of secular societies and what could be done about it. And Habermas's analysis was this. What we have done is we have lost a sense of why we are a community and we are breaking down into radical individualism which is destroying the whole fabric of the society. How can we, without being re-enslaved to Christianity, how can you help us to find our way out of that? And Benedict had an opportunity to speak to that world, an opportunity that others would not have had. And he didn't come at them and say, well, you fool, look what you've done. He said, no. He said, the problem is you have no reason to be a community. There is nothing to draw you into being a community. In fact, what you need is a point beyond yourself as a common reference, as something you can agree on that will draw you beyond your own self-interest into something greater than yourself. And 
they said, really? <laughs> well, how come when we tried to do that, it didn't work? And Benedict let them know, well, that really is a problem that you will have to solve. Because otherwise, you're not going to exist. You're going to break down into radical, conflicting tribalism. And you're going to fulfill the prediction. He didn't say this, but you're going to fulfill the prediction of Francois Mitterrand of France, who said, the world has underestimated the fundamental tribalism of the European people. He saw the breakdown coming as Christianity waned. Why? There was no longer an acceptable authority to reconcile the needs of the one and the many and to reestablish within that society the bonds that hold us together in the fulfillment of our own nature as essentially and most human when we are relational beings who are bonded to one another in a Trinitarian reflection of the love of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Authority then becomes a form of love which reconciles the disparate parts of our small family lives, of our society, of our church. And while allowing creativity, dynamism, and freedom, it keeps us also tied to the very nature of our being and to the very foundations of creation. And in doing that, it is in fact, and I've said this before, the Catholic Church is necessary for the survival of civilization. Because without authority to reconcile the disparate divisions and interests of global communities, there is no future. There is nowhere to go. Look at our own country. Look at the radical partisanship. No longer does the nation attract us. Now, the political party becomes everything for us. And the more the nation moves away and the political party emerges, the less reason there is to be a community. And as such, the more divisive, vitriolic, and destructive politics becomes. The voice of the church says, you are bonded to each other. Your individual interests are important, but they must be reconciled with the whole. And if they are not, then there is nothing which is going to hold your society together. Marcus talked about this last night within the whole Christian community. This whole idea within the Christian community of, I have this insight. I see this. I know in my mind, therefore, the community is wrong, I am right, and I have the right, therefore, to begin my own church, my own community. And how long does that stay together until somebody else has a better idea? And then you're upset, and in this upset, Luther lamented some things in his life. He had a very good friend who was the pastor of the church in Wittenberg, Johannes Bugenhagen. And in a conversation with Bugenhagen, he said he was depressed. This was when he was old. The word of God is so clear. How come everybody's seeing it differently? Why aren't people seeing what's there? That's the role of authority, to reconcile those disparate insights and to bring them into some kind of tenuous unity with the whole. Because we fail as human persons when we do not have the humility to be obedient to authority 
And that does not mean subservient to it, but it means to understand that neither I nor the community am well and healthy without it. And that if it costs me a little bit of my insight and my understanding and my conviction for the sake of the other, I must give it away. That's what the saints have taught us. Many of them clashed with Rome. Many of them clashed with local bishops. But in the end, they were reconciled to the community and they gave it life and strength. How many of you ever disagreed with something that the hierarchy said? How many of you ever thought you might have had a better idea about something? And it isn't because the hierarch is so much wiser than you, but it's because the role, the office, holds together instead of tears apart. Authority, therefore, is love. The love that is the component, the foundational component of the human person. And that because of our sinfulness, it doesn't always look like love. But what is more loving than ultimately to provide for the well-being of all? What is more loving than ultimately to allow problems and troubles to be drawn in to the center of human experience? And what makes us more human than being relational in community, with others, in families, in church, in the world. Without that, without that, we run a high risk. You know, in primitive times, you could just join another tribe and go to war forever. But we've gotten to the point where when we do that, we blow everything up. We're too dangerous now. That's no longer a luxury that we can afford. Where is the center? Is the United Nations able to do that? I don't think so. Is the American government even able to? I don't think so. The authority lies with Peter and through Peter to the rest of the universal community and through that to every piece and part of our whole human existence, and also for the well-being of creation itself. For when, in fact, we have reached that point where all things are reconciled to Christ, what does that mean? It means the bond of love has finally penetrated throughout all of God's creation. And that all things, as Julian of Norwich says, then all things will be well. Thank you.